Good afternoon. A very warm welcome to all of you to this service in memory of Charles Gillespie, whose good and long life touched so many others, and whose contributions to his several fields, including one he helped to create, will live on and evolve in perpetuity. As we remember him today, we are following the form of worship and hearing the sacred music that were his particular requests. And what a joy to do so, for they help us to enjoy more fully his presence in spirit here with us today. Thank you for your friendship to Charles and for your presence here. Will you please rise as you are able and join together in our opening sentences. God is our hope and strength, a very present help in trouble. Lord, thou hast been our refuge, one generation to another. Let us pray. Remember thy servant, O Lord, according to the favor which thou bearest unto thy people, and grant that, increasing in knowledge and love of thee, he may go from strength to strength in the life of perfect service in thy heavenly kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost ever, one God, world without end. Amen. Let us sing together our hymn, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind, it is printed in your bulletin.
In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind and every winged fowl after his kind and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle, and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, 
and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to every thing that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Charles Gillespie was a great scholar in the field of the history of science. And I am sure that this will be a recurrent theme in the remembrances you will be hearing this afternoon. But I want to talk, insofar as I can, of the man himself, leaving to others better situated to address the lasting influence of his teaching and work. I do not recall the fir when I first met Charles Gillespie, but I do remember a time when a brief conversation with him made my day. I was finishing up my dissertation under Joseph Strayer while also precepting in Strayer's course on English constitutional history. But I was also on the job market, and I had recently had an interview. My wife Christine and I were happy at the prospect of employment and then settling down to have children. But as it happens, I did not get the position. Naturally, I went to see my advisor who said he would talk to the chair of the department about letting me be a lecturer, adjunct faculty, for a year so that I would be employed while I looked for a position in the next annual cycle of job hunting. Not long afterwards, the chair, Charles Gillespie, wrote me a note asking me to stop by his office. He told me about Professor Strayer's request, and he also mentioned that he had some information on my teaching from a group of students in my precepts. Together, these were enough for him in those days to offer me a one-year job. That was important, and I was always proud whenever I was in Charles's company to tell people that he had hired me. I think that he was pleased. At least he never told me to stop telling people. Equally important for me is that that initial conversation broke the ice between us in ways I could scarcely have foretold. After I went on to the regular faculty, Charles and his wife Emily reached out over and over again, determined to be kind to Christine and me. They regularly had us over for dinner or drinks, and we would invite them in return. When they went down to the shore, they would sometimes come back with freshly caught fish because they knew we liked it so much. And when they were in France, as they frequently were, and I was there also doing research, we would meet up for lunch or go together to their favorite Parisian restaurants. They seemed to enjoy our brood of little children. And when those children grew into their teen years, and it became rather widely known in this small town that they were no longer the unalloyed little darlings of their youth, Charles penned me a note of comfort at a particularly difficult moment, reminding me that they and I would get through all right. Charles and Emily were particularly enthusiastic about my wife Christine's uh, still lifes, which was a particular passion in her painting at the time, at the time the children were still at home. His favorite word to describe the paintings was charming, a word that could with justice be applied to him. Charles and I tended to dislike the same things, and that was a great bond. He had a way of raising an eyebrow or frowning, which expressed his disfavor for pomposity or for a bad scholarly paper or for a boring scholarly talk. But he also had a droll sense of humor. My relatively new colleague, Jenny Rampling, who was in the history of science, 
came with me a few times to visit Charles, who always wanted to know what was going on in the department and who the recently hired faculty were. On one of these very recent visits, I'm sure that my colleague Angela Krager, who often went with me, can scarcely believe that there will be no more of these visits. On one of these very recent visits, I gave Charles a copy of my new book. It isn't as massive as most of Charles's books, but that didn't bother me. However, he clearly got a kick out of asking me in front of Jenny, Bill, do you ever write big books? He had a twinkle in his eye when he said this, but it made her burst out in laughter. Charles impressed her with his beguiling wit. Despite the infirmities of age and the lingering effects of a stroke, he succeeded admirably. admirably. If I had been quicker, I would have replied, well, you hired me. I worried over the right word to sum up the Charles Gillespie I knew, and it finally occurred to me. It is a medieval French word, which has lost some of its depth in modern French and in English, which has borrowed it. Charles was de bonheur. It was an adjective used to describe one of the attributes of God in the Middle Ages. If one took it at its modern meaning, one could imagine God as a perfect host, a facilitator of conversation, the connoisseur of fine liqueurs. But in the Middle Ages, it evoked the portrait of a protective lord who showered the undeserving with gifts, with grace. That is how I shall remember Charles. He bestowed on me and on my family and many others here today, like Hans Arsleff, now Professor Emeritus of English, and Professor Leonard Rosenban, who's flown in from Utah for this service. He bestowed on us all the beauty of his friendship and the strong arm of his support. He hired me, but far more important, he was my dear friend. The American Philosophical Society meant a great deal to Charles Gillespie. For several years, he and I used to drive down every year for meetings of the Library Committee, and there I got to see him in action and know what a, an active part he took in the Philosophical Society. And later, of course, he donated his papers to that society. So it's fitting, it's appropriate, it's gratifying that the society wanted to be represented here today at this service in memory of Charles Gillespie. Friends, when Benjamin Franklin founded the American Philosophical Society in 1743, it was his intention to bring together accomplished men and women of a curious mind to promote useful knowledge while appreciating good fellowship. Charles Gillespie was without question everything that Franklin had in mind when envisioning a society member. He was elected to membership in, uh, in the American Philosophical Society at the young age by society standards of 54 in 1972 in recognition of his distinguished studies in the history of French science and technology from the late monarchical period through the revolution in the Napoleonic eras. Charles added to our understanding of science and its history most significantly by being chief editor of the Dictionary of Scientific Biography. In these days of the internet, one has to be of a certain age to appreciate the monumentality of the project. For basic information on the lives and work of scientists through the ages, it is still unsurpassed and remains a frequently used resource among the society's library staff and visiting researchers. Charles, usually with his beloved Emily by his side, attended every one of the Society's biannual meetings from 1973 to 2008. Alas, it is conduct of one of these meetings that precludes APS leadership from being here with us today to express their respect and appreciation for Charles personally. He himself spoke at two such meetings. The first occasion in 1976 was entitled The Liberating Influence of Science in History. His second presentation in 1984 was entitled America's First Balloon Flight, Federal Flight 1, Philadelphia to Woodbury at 10 a.m. January 9, 1793. Charles also willingly gave his time to the society, serving for three decades on its Committee on Library. 
With this last, and with his particularly keen eye for collection development, we are delighted that Charles chose to donate his own papers to the library, where they will be available to future scholars, while also acknowledging the Society's evolving role in documenting not just the history of science, but also the historiography of science. The Society is demonstrably better for its long association with Charles Gillespie. And while he will be missed, Charles remains an inspiration to excellence, to scholarship, and to civility for all of us and for generations to come. Franklin would be proud. On behalf of the members and staff of the American Philosophical Society, sincerely, Keith Stewart Thompson, Executive Officer. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jim McClellan. I'm professor of history of science at uh, Stevens Institute of Technology up the road in Hoboken, New Jersey. I was a graduate student in the Princeton program of history of science. I studied with Charles Gillespie and I wrote my dissertation with him as my Dr. Vater. I received my PhD from Princeton in 1975. I've been asked to make brief remarks about Charles and his graduate students. This is a hard task. Charles graduated something like 32 PhD students. He told me once, I know and know of many of them. But of course, there's much that I do not know and cannot know. Still, I've kept up with Charles, with the Princeton program uh, over the years. I've had my own Gillisonian experiences. Uh, so let me venture this. We all know that Charles was immensely proud of the program he created in 1960. Charles wrote two autobiographical pieces, one in 1999 and Apologia Pro Vita Sua in the History of Science Society journal ISIS, and another, A Professional Life in the History of Science in the Festschrift that appeared in his honor in 2012. In both, he spoke about the program and its foundation, but he says hardly a word about his students. I find this telling. Charles was friendly, of course, uh, in the way that everybody knows and we knew, but he kept a distance from his students. I always called him Charles, but a late friend of mine and another of his PhD students, Harold Dorn, a man older and more experienced than myself, felt uncomfortable with anything other than Professor Gillespie. In the same festschrift I mentioned, Cy Mauskopf, uh, an early Gillespie student and later professor at Duke, wrote about how intimidating the program and its seminars and expectations were in general. And for us, Gillespie stood on Mount Olympus of the history of science, the field we had entered and were trying to master. He had founded the program after all. He had known Alexander Quirle. He was then editing the monumental Dictionary of Scientific Biography, the DSB. He was a renowned scholar of the highest order, digging deeply into the archives of old regime France. And while I was at Princeton, he was made a member of the uh, American Philosophical Society. Gillespie's genius, it seems to me, uh, stemmed from his intimidating intelligence, the frightening breadth and depth of his knowledge, and his sophisticated critical perspectives. Gillespie brought Kuhn to Princeton, after all, and for a decade they ran the program together as equals. Perhaps some more secure and more mature of his graduate students uh, felt more at ease in engaging Gillespie uh, as an equal. But I dare say, uh, the run of his students in the program, myself very much included, uh, stood in awe of him. Let me give two examples of my dealings with Gillespie as a graduate student. One was the meeting we had uh, to discuss topics for my dissertation. I had come to his office uh, to propose a straightforward institutional history of the 18th century scientific society the Société Royale des Sciences de Montpellier. Historians, uh, notably uh, Daniel Roche, uh, 
uh, had studied other contemporary learned societies, and there was a standard way to do this. But no one had looked carefully uh, at the Montpellier Society. Gillespie heard what I had to say on the subject, and then he asked, but what do you really want to do? I replied <laughs> that I really wanted to take on the whole of contemporary learned societies across the 17th and 18th centuries. Gillespie said, well, then go ahead and do that. You can imagine the gesture that accompanied it. I learned a valuable lesson from Charles that afternoon uh, to steer my own boat where the winds of curiosity and inquiry would take me. A second vignette apropos of standards of historical scholarship being inculcated. I was in Gillespie's office one day shortly after we had decided on a dissertation topic. He said, well, you'll need to read Adolf von Harnack's History of the Berlin Academy, the Geschichte der Königlich Preußischen Akademie der Wissenschaften zu Berlin, published in 1901. And he pulled the volume from behind his desk and handed it to me. Um, Gillespie's copy was inscribed by Harnack to the German historian Theodore Mumsen. My German was and is a weak, but nevertheless, I plowed through Harnack's tome. For me, that task was made more difficult because the book was printed in the old-style German Gothic script. Little did I know at the time that there was another edition printed in a more easily readable Roman type. Later, I wondered if Gillespie knew too. <laughs> Gillespie's aloofness doesn't mean that he didn't care for his students, and I'm sure each of us owes a debt of gratitude to Charles for all that he did for us over the years. For me, that would start uh, with him admitting me to the program in the first place. I had an unusual background, and he took a chance on me. The seminar I took with him on Newton and, the, and Newtonian science uh, proved a turning point in our relation in that I met his standards and that he didn't consider me a complete flake. His support continued after I graduated, ultimately helping me land the history of science job uh, at Stevens. Most importantly, I'm indebted to Gillespie uh, for charting, uh, to Charles really, uh, for charting a domain of research that I pursued in my own work. Charles ended up proud of me in my scholarly career after Princeton, as he was proud of his other graduate students and their accomplishments uh, as well. But the thought crossed my mind that his pride as Dr. Vater stemmed almost as much uh, from us as a group as it did uh, from us as individuals. I hasten to add uh, that my wife and I became better acquainted with Charles and Emily in later years. And it's fair to say that mutual affection and a different sort of relation uh, grew after graduate school for me. But that's another story. I had promised Charles uh, to come and visit again this fall. Uh, but alas, uh, time ran out. Thank you. Hello, afternoon. I'm Michael Decker. I first encountered Charles Gillespie four years before I actually met him. And I was graduating from a rural high school in Louisiana. And I'd just been admitted to Princeton and I got a reading list with two books on it that I was supposed to read before I got to campus. And you know, being from rural Louisiana, I was sufficiently terrified I, I was gonna read both books thoroughly. Well, one of them was Tris Tropique by Claude Levi-Strauss. And the other was this book, The Edge of Objectivity by Charles Gillespie. Uh, this is a copy that I bought as a senior in high school. Well, and as most, many of the scholars and, and students, uh, I met him for the first time walking into the Daniel Sachs Scholarship interviews and got to know him as a real person. As I was flying up here on, on American Flight 138, I was reading the Princeton Alumni Weekly Memorial, mentioning how Charles was, was a mentor to Dan Sachs and emphasizing that. And really for a moment I felt that I had brushed shoulders 
with Ann Sachs as I'd never felt before in this way. We all had the same experience, the scholars, students, and Dan, because we were sitting across from Charles as our mentor, and much more, as a friend, a sponsor, a godfather uh, in the Episcopalian sense, not the Sicilian sense. And in my case, he was like a father to me. So I felt for a moment that I, could, I, could, I was sitting next to Dan Sachs looking at Charles and seeing that experience that he had, because I believe few if any of the scholars actually met Dan Sachs, and yet he totally changed our lives. But Charles was our connection with Dan, and Charles also changed our lives. Well, that was what was the same. What was different and unique is that Charles would turn around to you, to all of us, and look at this uniqueness in each of us, as a scholar, as a Sachs scholar, just as a student. He would see this uniqueness, and it was like a secret message in there, and he was going to help you decode it. And whether it was a love of classics, or physics, or Proust, in my case, uh, it was a love of poetry that I think he spotted. And in that light, he actually uh, suggested that I try to write a poem for this occasion. And when Charles suggests something, you try. So here goes. The Voice of Objectivity in Memory of Charles Coulston Gillespie. Outside, late leaves try on fovist paints. The geese turn restless and honk like the traffic passing by, playing the music of noise. While the quiet here, your absence, Charles, changes into presence, your voice remains with us. Remembered as that voice of certainty, yes, yet certainly open-minded, entirely free, and there's this joyousness that carries slightly higher, ah, as if some sixth sense hits, some epiphany is on the way. Professore, I imagine Galileo at your welcome party. What's this thing, relativity? What have they done with my universe, my rectangles? Then your spirited repartee, those end stop sentences let fly, sharply fencing thought with thought. As you battle, the mystery of science deepens. The more we know, the more mysterious the questions grow. Quote, glimpses of great order and altogether inhuman high beauty, end quote, I'm quoting you, flicker like heavenly auroras, many low clouds quickly refuse, resuming their disguise as so much overcast. We overhear your bow-tied bon mot, the knowing aside on Montgolfier's trial balloons above Paris, or Sadi Carnot fitting energetics to a T, even voicing reason to Patton up in his Jeep, arms akimbo, shouting madly for more artillery. And what is the sound of your higher judgment being quietly withheld when you sensed more promise gained for us, scholars, ephebes, by silence. Silence, thus, becomes a form of love. Professore, imagine a sound like applause, murmurings, the host, invisible, waiting. The receding line extends all the way to Pythagoras, who just has to ask you about the square root of two. So, Charles, we must let you go. Let your bright angel, memory, light within us now and make us all, all carriers of your voice.
Out of the deep have I called unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. O let thine ears consider well the voice of my complaint. If thou, Lord, wilt be extreme to mark what is done amiss, O Lord, who may abide it. For there is mercy with thee, therefore shalt thou be feared. I look for the Lord, my soul doth wait for him. In his word is my trust. A reading of the opening verses of the Gospel according to St. John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness to the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was not in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came on to his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him.
Will you please rise? And let us pray. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. Let us pray. O Father of all, we pray to thee for those whom we love, but see no longer. Grant them thy peace. Let light perpetual shine upon them. And in thy loving wisdom and almighty power, work in them the good purpose of thy perfect will. Amen. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. <laughs>